And I'd like to welcome you to the banquet for the 2019 USHA Nationals. We had our board meeting a little earlier this week. And the good news, well, actually, there's lots of good news. First of all, our election results. Two at-large elections, Ralph Fragoso and Steve Burrell. Congratulations, at-large board members. And I really appreciate Gary Rohr being here because June 10 to 14 of next year, we're going to the University of Minnesota with the Minnesota State Handball Association. Gary, thanks for you hosting us next year. June 10 to 14, a little earlier. Site of last year's Worlds and Nationals. In case you don't know, I'm Vern Roberts. I work for all of you. It's mostly a pleasure. Same here. Thank you. And I do want to introduce our president. I work for you all. Leanne Martin, our president, was elected by you all. President Leanne Martin. Thank you, Vern. Good evening. And on behalf of the USHA staff and the board of directors, I would also like to welcome you this evening to the Four Wall Nationals. Once again, our handball family in Southern California and the good folks at Los Cab have been kind enough to host this prestigious event for us again. So thank you to the great staff here at Los Cab. Thank you to the Southern California Handball Association with the great people, Jim Van Boss, Mike Kane. Thank you for supporting our sport and supporting this event. And of course, a special thank you to Hall of Famer Gary Cruz, who has hosted and directed. <laughs> the last time I was up here, I was inducting him into the Hall of Fame. Tonight, I'm just thanking him because he's already in the Hall of Fame. So I would like to thank him, though, because this is about the 10th national championship here at Los Cab that he has hosted and helped direct. Also, our heartfelt thanks to all our volunteers, people who are working the registration desk, the tournament control desk, people who are serving food, people who are walking around picking up towels and trash, and all the other things that you're doing alongside the USHA staff. We honestly could not do this without you. Our four wall championships really showcase our perfect sport. Our youngest competitor this week is 12 years old, and he's playing in the men's C bracket, although he could have entered in the 13 and under division. And our most mature player this week is 87 years young, playing in the 85 plus division. You know, if, if that doesn't show you that handball is a lifetime sport, I don't know what does. But also, this week, the competition and the camaraderie are evidence that handball really is the perfect sport. Tonight, a couple of the game's greatest players are being inducted into the Handball Hall of Fame. David Chapman and Vince Munoz were not only fierce opponents over the years, they were also partners in tournaments. And what they did in and for handball is simply phenomenal. But you're going to hear more about that later. So again, thank you so much for joining us here this week and this evening, and thank you for supporting handball. Thank you, Leanne. We get to give out some cool stuff. We've got a very select group of folks who have won 10 national master's titles. Those are called grandmasters. They've got very cool sweaters to get, they get to put on. And some of you, actually most of you, you know how hard it is to get to 10 tournaments. It's not easy to travel, play. They're not all in your hometown. Well, we've had 10 titles here, but you don't get to win them all in, Los, in Southern Cal because they're pretty hard to win here. These are our game's best supporters also because they go to 
not just 10, 10 tournaments, but they win 10 tournaments. Please join me in welcoming Ron Cole and William Cervantes to the Grand Masters Club, 10 National Masters titles. Ron Cole, William Cervantes. Select company. Right. Congratulations, Ron. Thank you. William. Thank you. Thanks for supporting the tournaments. Congratulations. Speaking of titles. There's some more history happening here this week. The last tournament, Ed Grossenbacher won his 56th. You hear that? 56th National Masters title. That tied him with Max Laskow, who had 56. Ed's still alive in two this weekend to surpass the great Max Laskow. And for all of you late bloomers, that's what we're gonna call you, late bloomers, neither Max nor Ed won one till they were playing in the 50s Golden Masters, then won 56. Ed, you're amazing. Max was amazing also. To win 56 after turning 50, I don't know how you do it. God bless you. Late bloomers. I'd like to invite uh, our Hall of Fame chairman, Mike Dow, who is going to get into the night's festivities and inductions. Coach Dow. Will all the Grand Masters with sweaters please stand up? Grand Masters, 10 plus national titles. I'd like to recognize a fellow Marine, a Hall of Fame contributor, a great player, having been in falling, failing health. Alvis Grant painted the portraits of each Hall of Fame inductee currently hanging in the USHA Hall of Fame. Alvis was a survivor of the Iwo Jima campaign in World War II, and we lost 9,000 Marines on that island. And Alvis, well, I think it's only appropriate that we take a brief moment of silent reflection for one of our most con outstanding contributors to our game. It is now my pleasure to welcome into the Hall of Fame two great players who required very little discussion in our meeting when their names were brought to our attention. Uh, we call them no-brainers because their records stand for themselves. Vince Munoz won 22 USA national titles from 1990 to 2005 in singles, doubles, both in four-wall and three-wall competition. Will Paul Durso and Vince Munoz please come forward uh, for your induction into the Hall of Fame? Paul Durso will make the induction speech. You all have the program. We don't need 
to review this program. This, I mean, if you don't know this individual's game, if you play golf, go do something, find another hobby. And it doesn't say invisible, it says invincible. Let me tell you, courage, character, consistency, qualities that are not, haven't been measured so highly in sports today. How he could do this again and again. Vincent Munoz is a handball savant. Great, greater, greatest, let the boys with the beer in the bar figure that all out. Not doing that here tonight, no way. Post pre-World War II, post World War II, when the template for handball was being set up for the future and coming into the next century, the Jimmys, the Walters, the Joes, the Victors, the, I mean, unbelievable. Paul, 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 Paul. Fearless, Freddy, Freddy, naughty. <laughs> and John by holding the door for yet more to come. So, you know, humbleness is what Vincent has given us as a gift. He has reminded us. I mean, students can look up to him now. Peers, oh my God, those who have played with him, against him, or have watched him, understand this. Even elders who think that they are the teachers and the coaches, he has reminded us of the qualities of what an athlete could, should, hopefully be, is not, but he is. Vincent Munoz has been honored also civically by Los Angeles City County government officials, a proclamation, declaration, honoring and bringing colors and rising our sport of handball. Who in heck, holy hell, gets these kinds of honors? Vincent Munoz. I gotta say. So the stories, again, I'm sorry, not today, but Toledo, let me tell you, Toledo, there should be a, a, a statue. I mean, I went, I asked Eddie Chapa, his favorite partner, Eddie, give me some, give me, give me something on Vince. I blah, 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 blah. Spit started coming out of his mouth. He couldn't even, there is not a one. There's so many. Handball players gave up going to Toledo, waiting for Vincent to trip, fall, break his neck, die, quit, retire, any of the above, all of the, nothing, no. Consistency, consistency, this is greatness. So I gotta say, people are always asked, Vincent, tell us your, you know, your secret. Give us something, give us, give us some inspiration. Oh. I found out that secret in life. Take the word life and drop the L and put a W there. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I don't want to go too fast here. Some of you might be slow. Now, some of you are not good at this. I understand that. What I'm trying to say is inspiration and support. You only all know the game, but his secret weapon a childhood sweetheart. <laughs> Movies are made about this. Literary documents and books are written. And on the subject of movies, I cannot let it go. In the movie, Rocky. <laughs> there we are with Terry Cherie, Sylvester Stallone, they're in a hospital bed. He wasn't getting much support. You know, we understand this. We're all characters. But look at us. From the North Pole, Alaska, New York, what we do to come here to play our game. But back to that hospital, I can't let it go, when she squinted with her eyes and finally opened them. Rocky couldn't train. He couldn't punch, couldn't do anything. And the eyes opened, and she just said, when, 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 and Burgess Meredith Rock, what are we waiting for? Let's go!
inspiration. Get it. I don't care if it's from your grandmother, the cat, the dog, the mouse, the rat, the grandfather, the son. Get a spark that will hit your piston, that will keep you drive and go. So it is very special tonight, the United States National Handball Association, 100 years. I mean, this is a signature move. So on their behalf, I would like to congratulate Vincent Munoz, 2019 Hall of Fame. Wow, Paul, thank you. Appreciate that. We thank you. All the you. work you do. Good evening, everybody. I just want to uh, thank everybody for being here tonight. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate David Chapman for getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. He was just an awesome player. We matched together. Me and him was probably the best match we could ever do. <clears throat> I want to thank him for that. As for me, I grew up in the city of Commerce. Uh, I turned pro at 18 years old. I got to travel all over the country. I met a lot of people, met a lot of friends. And I got to play the best players in the world. I got to play uh, David Chapman, Doxy Walsh. I got to play uh, not, uh, John Bike. John Bike, I'm pretty nervous, so bear with me, OK? <laughs> And Paul Brady. And I even, I was fortunate to play uh, Nati Alvarado Sr. So I got to play all those guys. So that was really awesome. I want to I wanna thank my coach mentor, uh, Tony Wante. This guy did an awesome job with us. He started a great program in the City of Commerce. And it helped a bunch of people, a bunch of little kids. And that helped me to achieve my goals in my career in handball. He actually had like 10 kids, maybe like 10 kids. It was a bunch of us, and he took us to like every single tournament. So he took us, and out of those 10 kids, four of us turned pros. Four of us turned pros, and we all lived in the same block. Can you believe that? <laughs> and that was, uh, that was David Silvera, Tati Silvera, Myself and Richard Lopez, Richard Valenzuela Lopez, he changed his name so I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all those guys at, uh, at La Habra, La Habra LA Fitness. That's just a bunch of great guys to play with. I have an awesome time with those guys. I want to thank, uh, oh man, this guy, he's amazing to me. I want to thank my friend Marcos. This guy was just amazing to me. We had a lot of fun. We, we traveled to the last two years of the final pro stops of the USHA. But we just had a blast together. And he pushed me. And Marcos is the real reason that I won my four wall national title. So I want to thank him for that. You're a good friend. <laughs> and finally, I want to thank my wife and kids. They're just awesome. This is a supportive family. I love them so much. And I, and I thank you. I thank you then for supporting me in everything I do. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. The second player to be inducted tonight, posthumously, is David Chapman. He began his remarkable career 
with a number of titles starting at the age of 11, then 13, then 15, then 17, then 19. And then he went on to win 27 national titles and four world titles in singles and doubles. Will John Chapman and David Fink please come forward to provide the induction ceremony? Dave had a mystique and an aura about him that he cultivated and that he really embraced. And uh, I first started seeing Dave at the tournaments when I was 11 and he was 13 and you could feel that mystique even then. We didn't speak for the first five years that we saw each other. We were two of the youngest people at the tournaments. We should have been hanging out, but we never did. We were at the NYAC, I was 16. It was five years after the first time I'd seen him. And we were at the tournament desk and the tournament director asked us to go to lunch. And we really had no excuses to avoid each other anymore. <laughs> so by the time we got to lunch, we walked about three blocks. And it was like we were best friends, like so many of you here uh, were with Dave. I mean, he built so many incredible friendships. And our friendship carried on for 25 years. You know, it was, it was incredible. Um, to go to Dave Chapman's home for any handball player, that's like a golfer going to the Masters. You know, the, to walk in, and of course he greets you that you're in the home of the greatest handball player of all time. And you see his trophy case, and he's, he's got the world championship crystals and the national championships, and it's special. It's, it's overwhelming, and I know so many people came to take lessons with him, and that's kind of their introduction. And he didn't really need to do much more after that. I mean, they knew they were in the presence of real greatness. One of Dave's defining characteristics was making it impossible to say no to him. A few months after we had first started talking, he called me and he said, you got to come out to Venice Beach. He was living in Long Beach at the time. You know, there's a three-wall tournament. It's a pro stop. you got to come. So there I am. I got on the plane the next day. You know, I was hanging out with with Dave and his buddy, Ed O'Neill. And a couple years later, we were in West Virginia. I was home from college vacation. It was just about an hour from my house, and they brought Naughty Jr. in, and, and Dave was there. And Naughty beat Dave. It was the first time he'd ever beat him, and Dave was so upset. You know, he's throwing his bag, and he's telling me he stinks and everything. And he looks at me, and he says, you coming back to Springfield with me? He was living in Missouri at the time. And I said, yeah, okay. So I rode 13 hours with Dave and Jimmy <laughs> all the way back to Springfield, all the way through the night. <laughs> a couple years ago at the Simple Green US Open, probably about 10 years ago, I lost in the first round and I was so upset. I was sitting in the broadcast booth and I had the Travelocity up. I was making my flight. I was just one click away from, from going home and I just, started dating my wife at the time and she was expecting me to come home and you know we've only been dating a couple of months and he said no you're, we're going to montana and then we're going to las vegas and then we're going to the plumber stop <laughs> so so i just you know canceled out of, of that and i called my now wife and i said oh, it's, i'm not going to be home for about three or four weeks <laughs> she wasn't happy at all at all. But that, you know, that was an incredible trip. Um, getting to spend time with Fred and, and meeting John. At the time, John, I think you were about 12 and really had a great weekend. Some of my greatest memories are, you know, spending time with Dave's family. I've spent time with Dave's mom in Long Beach and um, just wonderful memories. And the same goes for when Dave came to Pittsburgh. Dave came to Pittsburgh for the first time when he was 20, we did an exhibition, and he leaves an indelible image on every person he meets. There's, every person that encounters him in a tournament has a story about him, and 
it seemed like he was never there. He would just play and leave and go to his hotel and come back. But at the end of a tournament, everyone seemed like they had a memory with him from that event. I never understood how. But, you know, I had a chance to watch Dave's greatness hundreds of times from outside the court and inside the court. And every time you watched him play, just left you speechless. The shots that he could make, no matter how many times you watched him, he was the only guy that could beat you 21 to three and you felt like you played well. <laughs> you, you know, I, I can remember playing him in Kansas City and I, I thought I was playing so great. You know, I had a great win to get to the semifinals and I mean, I couldn't do anything. You know, I hit a great serve, he punched it to the ceiling, I'm running back into the right corner, hit a good ceiling shot, it comes off the back wall by six inches and he flat kills it. That was the whole match, it only took about 11 minutes. <laughs> but that's what Dave could do, he could make the greatest players in the world look ordinary. In Tucson, and during one of his comebacks, he played Owen Kennedy in the finals. Owen Kennedy's outstanding, one of the greatest players in the world, and he made him look like the most ordinary player you've ever seen. I mean, he couldn't do anything. Eight months later, Martin Mulkerns, or excuse me, a couple years later, Martin Mulkerns, who's in the semifinals here tomorrow, had just made the finals of the Nationals and played Dave in one of our qualifiers. I mean, it's a tough qualifier. And Dave just, I mean, completely dismantled Martin. This great young player, Dave's in there hitting these sky hook kills out of the air. I mean, it, Martin never lets me forget it. I was up, up top in the balcony, ooing and aahing. Martin heard it all. <laughs> I like to remind him of it, too. But, you know, Dave would never let you know when something was important to him. And, you know, I believe this was very important to him. He was very, very proud of what he accomplished. And it was evident. You know, you walked into his house, you saw the trophies. He made sure you knew you were amongst greatness. <laughs> so I, even though he would come up here and say thank you, I do believe that this was important to him. When my wife and I eloped about a year and a half after that three-week trip, <laughs> we told a few of our friends, and you know, I told Dave, yeah, you know, we're going to Vegas. I don't, I don't care, no. I'm not, I'm not doing anything about that. He was gonna be in Vegas, though. So we get to the wedding chapel and Emmett's there and a few of our other friends had traveled in and, and there's Dave, just like, you know, like he was gonna be there the whole time. After the ceremony, we didn't know what to do. We, I didn't have anything planned. And Dave said, let's just go outside. He'd ordered two stretch limousines and he put Trish and I in one of them and the rest of the group got in another one. He set up the most beautiful night this amazing dinner, and you know, Dave knew his way around Vegas. So we just had just an outstanding, greatest memory, I think, that we, we own um, because of Dave. I mean, that's how he was. He was, he was generous, and you know, he was a great friend. And I see so many people out here tonight that have been touched by Dave and that are you know, great friends of his as well, and you know, Dave, had the ability to connect people, whether they were inside of handball or out. And so often you meet friends of friends and you say hello and that's about it. But with Dave's friends, they became your friends outside of him. I'm looking at one of Dave's good buddies, Abe here. And Abe and I have hung out so many times, I think even without Dave. And all ages, all backgrounds, and everyone just became friends and that was, something that Dave didn't even seem like he was trying to do, but he's the only person I've ever seen that could do it. As we all know, Dave was very, very competitive in everything. And you could be in his house and beat him in ping pong or pool, and he would just give you that look and the smirk. He'd say, well, I can't be the best in the world at everything. <laughs> but he was always very, very gracious in victory and defeat. The one time I beat him out of about 30. He offered no excuses and he just told me I played awesome and that meant so much to me and then he crushed me two months later <laughs> at the Nationals. He was always so hard on himself, you know, I could never understand it. It was in Lansing at the Nationals and I'd gotten there a little bit later in the day 
and I saw David, it was his birthday. His birthday was always during the Nationals. And I said, you know, what were the scores? And happy birthday. He said, loser birthday. <laughs> he just lost in the quarterfinals. So every year, we would call each other and wish each other a happy loser birthday. <laughs> but, you know, there was nothing like Dave sitting courtside at one of your matches. I know as a pro player, and I'm sure all the other pro players would say the same, and, and players of all levels would say the same. It made you play harder, it made you play with more anxiety, and you were always trying to impress the great one. You know, you could never count Dave out, even if he'd taken these long breaks, and even if he was injured. I remember when he won his last four wall nationals in 2011, he hadn't played in eight months going into that tournament because he'd hurt his knee at the US Open in October. And he comes in there and he's struggling through every round. I think he had 11, seven, he beat Tommy Little in the quarterfinals there. Then he beat Naughty, I think about the same score. And he was way down in the first game of the final against Sean and came back and won. And it was incredible because he couldn't really move. You know, Dave's good buddy and good friend of mine, Gary Machart, reminded me of a story tonight. On the webcast, you know, you see everybody hitting the ball 80 miles per hour, three inches high, diving all over the court. And when you watch Dave, he'd hit a ball 20 miles per hour and his opponent wasn't even in the frame. And you're thinking, how is this possible? But Dave's last event, you know, Dave was always planning these big comebacks. He was always gonna come back and, you know, I always told him he was crazy. But the 2017 three wall ball championships in Las Vegas, he entered the X-Fest, so he's playing in four divisions, and made the semifinals of the three wall, small ball, and then in the, the one wall, small ball, he defeated the current national finalist, the current world champion, the current defending champion, makes it all the way to the final. I don't even know if I've ever seen him play that well. And this was after not really playing for three or four years. So, Today's a celebration of Dave's life and celebrating all of the incredible accomplishments he's had on the court, but also, just as importantly, all the great friendships he built off the court. So, John. Uh, for everybody that doesn't know me, I'm John Chapman. I, um, I'm David's younger brother. Just to start things off, I wanna get something straight between me my dad, Fred Chapman, and my brother, uh, David. Fred is easily the worst athlete in the family. <laughs> At the beginning of my high school career, uh, my dad and I took a trip down to St. Louis uh, for the 4th of July and my brother had the most incredible trip planned out for us. We went to a Cardinals game, sat a couple rows behind home plate. Uh, we attended a big 4th of July party at one of his buddy's houses and I saw the most amazing fireworks show I've ever seen. And of course, a trip to Dave and Buster's where he told me he'll beat me at everything that we play. <laughs> it was from this point on, me and David really had a amazing relationship and connection, and we started keeping in contact every day since. And I would travel down to St. Louis, usually with my dad, uh, from that point on every summer. And when I was in 17, I played in Vegas uh, for a basketball tournament, and David planned a trip to come down and hang out with me while I was down there. And I was staying in some real low-end Super 8 motel, and David wasn't very happy about that, so... <laughs> He gave me three separate hotel keys to the nicest hotels in Vegas so I can stay there and go to their pools and stuff. And it was quite the experience and I got to hang out with him. I was only 17 years old. I went and gambled with him, went to all the adult pool parties. There was just something about David that he always made himself feel like he belonged there and made everyone else feel like he belonged there, no matter if he didn't. So I was able to go on all his adventures with him throughout Vegas at 17, which was really cool. 
<laughs> From that point on, we always kept in contact. Like I said, he was always bragging about his lifestyle, texting me, and he proceeds to tell me he can't wait till I'm 21 so we can go do all this together. We talked about many trips, going to Miami, New Orleans, uh, New York, and of course Vegas. And we had an amazing relationship, and I couldn't ask for a better brother than him at the time. I'm extremely proud of him to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. He was one of the biggest role models in my life, growing up playing basketball and handball. And some of the biggest traits that I admire, great, uh, biggest tr things I admire were his competitiveness, confidence, and willingness to win no matter what. And like I said, I played basketball. I played basketball at Montana Tech for college. And one of those examples of those great qualities I was down in St. Louis and we went down to the club and we were just working out. He was doing a little workout and I did a basketball workout and he came in to play basketball against me. We played some horse, played some one-on-one -on -one, and I beat him pretty easy in all of those. I was up 6-0 in one-on-one -on -one. he said, all right, that's enough. I've had enough. But he could never leave without feeling like he was on top. So he walked over gently, just grabbed one of the basketballs and he proceeded to make three half-court shots in a row. I was like, wow, I could do that. Well, 50 shots later, I still haven't made three in a row. <laughs> and to top that, every time I'd make one, he'd step back and shoot another one and make it, just so he made more than I did. And it just really showed he hated to lose. He was a bad loser. Um, he could never leave somewhere without being on top. And that attitude is a big part of why we're celebrating his induction to the Hall of Fame today. I miss him and think about him every day, as my, many of us do in this room. And it's been an honor and privilege not, to, not only to know David, but to call him my brother. So cheers to David, the great one. Just one last note, one thing to end on. Uh, I want to congratulate Vince Munoz on also being inducted to the Hall of Fame. Um, I know David would have been really excited to be inducted with you um, on this night, so congratulations. Yeah. We're very proud of the Hall of Fame. Hope you can come to Tucson sometime and see it. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for a great night. Vince, Fred, David, everybody, congratulations. John, thank you.